This is part two of our look at improper integrals in single variable calculus. If you missed part one, go back and watch that first. I'm calling our three parts type one, two, and three, but that's just my numbering system. That's not necessarily some standard universal way to talk about improper integrals. So what we're going to see in this video is how to integrate a function or assess whether or not it's integrable over a domain which looks like negative infinity to infinity. What we need to do is break that computation up into two separate integrals where you choose some finite number a. I think in every single example today, a is going to be zero because that's often the case because zero is a great number to plug into uh, antiderivatives in most cases. What we need to do is take any such integral, break it into these two pieces, and then we need each of these pieces individually to exist and equal a finite number in order for us to include that the improper integral that we're analyzing converges. If either of these diverges on its own, then the overall integral diverges. So what you cannot have is this one goes to infinity and, and this one goes to negative infinity and they cancel each other out or something like that. That's not what we're going to do. We need each of these to individually converge, then if they both do, we add them together and we say that the improper integral from negative infinity to infinity converges. For our first example, consider the integral from negative infinity to infinity of the expression one over one plus x squared. What we have here is both bounds are infinite. So the first thing I'm going to do is choose to chop this computation into two pieces by breaking it up at x equals zero. So we can say that this is the integral from negative infinity to zero of one over one plus x squared dx plus the integral from zero to infinity one over one plus x squared dx, like that. Now each of these is the type of improper integral that we did in part one. So what we will do is take this first expression and rewrite this as the limit as t goes to negative infinity of the definite integral from t to zero, one over one plus x squared dx. Then for the second one, you could use t again and just promise yourself that you'll keep them separate as two distinct computations, but I don't want to risk trying to cancel something out from the right with something from the left. So what I'm going to do is actually change my letter, if you will, from t to u. So for the second improper integral, I'm going to write the limit as u goes to infinity of the integral from zero to u of one over one plus x squared dx. If you haven't had time to think about how we will actually anti-differentiate this, take a moment to see if you recognize the antiderivative of this integrand. Hopefully you realize that the antiderivative of one over one plus x squared is arctan, but if you didn't, the antiderivative of this is arctan. So proceeding on with that knowledge, we can say that this is the limit as t goes to negative infinity of arctan of x, where for this one, I'm going to plug in t as the lower bound and zero as the upper bound. And then same story over here, except it looks a little bit different. This is the limit as u goes to infinity of arctan of x, where the lower bound is zero and the upper bound is what I'm calling u. Okay, now we just need to plug into this. Remember how arctan works. So this is the limit as t goes to negative infinity of arctan of zero, which is zero. Arctan goes through the origin, minus arctan of t. Then uh, I think I can write this. So plus the limit as u goes to infinity of arctan of u. And let me go ahead and write minus zero because arctan of zero is zero. Okay, I'll give you a second to look at this. And if you haven't thought about it recently, picture the arctan function. What are What is the limit of arctan of x as we go to negative infinity versus what is the limit of arctan as we go to positive infinity? y equals arctan of x is an increasing function trapped between two horizontal asymptotes at negative pi over two and pi over two. So each of these exists and is a finite number. In particular, arctan of zero is zero. 
arctan of t as t goes to negative infinity is negative pi over two. So it travels to the bottom horizontal asymptote as you travel to the left versus over here, it's going to be pi over two minus zero. So overall, the graph of this function does enclose a finite amount of area between its graph and the x-axis, and that area is actually pi. So this improper integral converges. Now let's look at another example. We would like to integrate y equals x cubed from negative infinity to infinity. We must break this computation up at some point on the x-axis, and as usual, I'm going to pick x equals zero. It's just usually the easiest one. So let's say that this is the limit as t goes to negative infinity of the definite integral from t to zero x cubed dx. And then we need to add to that the limit and I'm going to use u again as u goes to infinity of zero to u x cubed dx. Okay, carrying on, we can anti-differentiate this. So this is going to be the limit as t goes to negative infinity of one fourth x to the fourth. I'll just write x to the fourth over four with bounds at t and zero. Then the second one looks very similar. It's going to be the limit as u goes to infinity of x to the fourth over four. But this time the bounds go from zero to u. Okay, let's plug in our top and bottom bounds. For the first one, we'll have the limit as t goes to negative infinity of zero. So plug in zero, we get zero, minus t to the fourth over four. Very similar for the second one. So this is going to be the limit as u goes to infinity of u to the fourth over four minus zero. Okay, let's talk about this. Sometimes students don't like what I'm about to say, but this integral does not exist because neither of these exist. In fact, in order for it to exist, in order to say that this improper integral converges, we need both individually to converge. If either fails, the whole thing fails. In this case, both of them are failing, but it would be enough to just have one fail. So this is going to negative infinity overall. Overall, this is going to infinity. They do not cancel each other out. We cannot say, Oh, this amount cancels that amount, and overall the integral is zero. That's not what's happening here. This does not exist. This improper integral diverges. It is understandable to want to say that the area enclosed between the x-axis and the graph of y equals x cubed from negative infinity to infinity is zero. Geometrically, you could make this argument. We could say, just looking at it, that we have the same amount of positive and negative area because this is an odd symmetric function. And while that could be a geometric computation, it is not the Riemann integral of x cubed from negative infinity to infinity. So the way that Riemann integration is defined in terms of subintervals and rectangular areas, this improper integral does not exist. Let's wrap up with this example, where again, we're doing an integral from negative infinity to infinity. This time we're looking at the function y equals x e to the negative x squared. If you go ahead and look at that integrand, we're going to need to do a u substitution. So the overall setup is the same as the previous two integrals, but as we evaluate each of the two pieces that we write down, then we will need to incorporate a u substitution. Let's go ahead and break this up at zero. So I will write that this is the limit as t goes to negative infinity of the integral from t to zero, I think that's the best choice, x e to the negative x squared dx. 
then because I'm going to do a U substitution, I'm not going to use the letter U for my second one. I'm going to use H. So we will say the second piece is the limit as H goes to infinity of the integral from zero to H, X e to the negative X squared dx. Okay, like that. I won't be using the letter U to mean two different things. This is a pretty classic looking U substitution. Let's set U as negative X squared so that du is negative two x dx, or if you prefer, we could say negative one half du will replace the term x dx for both of these. The same u substitution in each one. The process of u substitution here is the same, even though this integral is improper. We're going to change the bounds. What will happen is our bounds might change in terms of t, but the thought process behind changing the bounds is the same. So if I carry this down to the next line, we'll have this as the limit as t goes to negative infinity of the integral from, now if I change my lower bound, when x is t, u is negative t squared. Whereas when x is zero, u is negative zero squared. So this integral will go from negative t squared to zero. Then the integrand itself is just negative one half e to the u du like so. Very similarly for the second one, this is going to be the limit as h goes to infinity from zero for the lower bound. So when x is zero, u is zero, or h is zero. No, u is zero. <laughs> like which letter means what now? When x is zero, u is negative zero squared. That's our lower bound. When x is h, the upper bound, u is negative h squared. So this will be the upper bound for the second integral. And then once again, we have negative one half e to the u du. Okay, let me give you a second to digest that. And if you'd like, go ahead and take this computation as far as you can. Okay, now we just need to anti-differentiate, plug in our bounds and compute these limits. So we'll leave the limiting process last. This will be the limit as t goes to negative infinity of negative one half e to the u antiderivative of e to the u is just e to the u, but we will plug in negative t squared as zero. And then for the second one, it will be the limit as h goes to infinity of negative one half e to the u with bounds at zero and negative h squared. Okay, let's go ahead and wrap this up. This will be the limit as t goes to negative infinity of negative one half e to the zero e to the zero is one. So overall, when I plug in the first bound, the top bound, I get negative one half, minus one half. So minus negative one half is plus one half. And then I started to write another negative for no reason. There we go. e to the negative t squared. Okay, so there's the evaluations at the top and bottom bounds for that first piece. For the second piece, we'll have the limit as h goes to zero, oh, sorry, infinity of negative one half e to the negative h squared minus negative one half. Okay, so it looks like that. We have here e going to increasingly negative numbers. As t goes to negative infinity, t squared flips it positive. So overall, this exponent above e is going to negative infinity. So that means that this piece goes to zero. Similarly, as h goes to infinity, this exponent here is going to negative infinity, which means that this piece also goes to zero. So overall, this integral is going to converge. We have a finite amount of area enclosed between the x-axis and the graph of this function, x, y equals x e to the negative x squared. And in fact, it's zero. We have negative one half plus one half at zero. That it's zero shouldn't be as surprising because this is an odd symmetric function which does converge. So this does converge. It's important to note here that it converges because both pieces converge. And I didn't do any canceling out until after I taken the limit. So the limit of this was negative one half. The limit of this was one half. 
They both individually exist, at which point we can add them together and get zero.